Shabbat Shalom to everyone, uh, wherever you may be in the world. And uh, we thank, uh, thank the Father that we can come together and assemble like this. And, uh, for those who might be watching on video, if you've ever thought of, well, maybe I should join in with the community live uh, sometime, uh, you can come in and, uh, and join us live. We'd love to meet you. Uh, we know many of you journey uh, just watching the teachings and things like that. And you might have had thoughts to come and be with us live. Uh, we meet at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time is the anchor in the ground. And if, uh, if you are led to come and join us, we'd I'd love to see you. So all you need to do is you just go to the rivershabbat.com website and scroll down and you'll see welcome to the river. And you just hit the subscribe button there and uh, put in your uh, first and last name and email address and that'll put you on our weekly newsletter. And uh, when you're on the weekly newsletter, we send that out every week and that contains the link to the live gathering uh, using uh, the Zoom platform. So if you are uh being led to come and be with us and join us then uh, you're very welcome to do so we'd love to see you okay 11 everywhere everywhere the 11 does anybody here gathering have 11 in your life we should see every hand on this screen go up. Every single hand. As of course, you're already glorified and there's no reason for you to be left here on the earth anymore. I suggest you put your hand up. You know, we're in a very serious uh, uh, appointed time, uh, the week of un unleavened. Um, generally speaking, uh, the you know, on the Christian side of the river, it tends to lean towards the Easter celebrations and traditions. And on the, uh, our brethren in uh, Judah, it tends to focus more on the Pesach meal and, uh, and gathering. What often gets uh, maybe little attention, um, which it shouldn't, is really sort of discussing, you know, why would the Father uh, every year want us to honor the week of unleavened bread for an entire week. Why is this such a big part of his appointed times? And so every year at this time, we look at and proclaim his appointed time in season. In other words, during the appointed times. And the reason we do that is because we are instructed to. This is not a time for our pet doctrines or teachings or, you know, something that we might be. This is a time where we are to actually reflect as the Father says to do so. And when we do that, it gives us a chance to revisit what we might think we already know. Um, and, uh, and then also to receive from the Father maybe something that he is prompting in our spirit, in our hearts, to relook at, to visit, maybe raising anew in our lives, um, uh, concerning matters of our walk, our faith. Um, this is not a bad thing. This is actually a good thing. Um, and none of us are exempt from this. Um, you know, whether we think we're all full of knowledge and so knowledgeable or, you know, whether we're teachers or rabbis or pastors or whatever it is, this week is for all of us to consider what this is about. Uh, no one is exempt. And so even when giving a teaching like this and whatnot, and as I always say, especially when it comes to the appointed times, everything I'm saying I, is in the mirror first and foremost before it is to any of you. Um, and it needs to be, particularly from a teaching perspective, um, because uh, often some of us that seek to try and serve the body as best we can, um, uh, we're sometimes the people that most of all need to hear the very things we're saying. And so every year I think about that too, uh, as uh, I share with the wider body, that uh, all of this is uh, meant for uh for me uh as much if not more than any of you so um so that's just important as we work through um for you to know really my heart in this 
uh, and then we're sharing with you and where it really uh, does uh, sit. And so that uh, when we work through issues of leaven in our lives, we often can take offense at things um, because there might be the very leaven in our house that's taking offense uh, has perhaps puffed us up in some way or we're refusing to let go of something or we've become stiff-necked or even prideful on matters. And this is a week now not to do that. Um, it's not about everybody else in your walk. This is actually about us and uh, our place before the Father spiritually. And so as a community, we encourage now that uh, we look at these things in a serious manner um, as we're instructed to do so uh, with none being exempt. So I've got leaven everywhere. That is not directed at you. This is directed with you. <laughs> okay. All right. Everyone's got that. We are together in this and, uh, and we are going to help each other get through this. Um, again, uh, many people are experiencing this for the first time in their lives. Uh, this year. And so there are certain things that I'll just cover slightly from a different angle and perspective every year. Um, but we will proclaim the appointed time in its season. And so what we're seeing here in the, uh, the, the chart you've got up before you is that we uh, commenced the week of unleavened with the Pesach meal and uh, going into twilight. And it, it, uh, it is a part of the week of unleavened. Uh, and so the appointed time of the week of unleavened bread includes the Pesach meal. And, uh, and so uh, we have this and we get into this unleavened bread day of one, which we're going through. And now we're working our way through this time of, uh, of when Messiah was in the grave for three nights and three days. And this leads up to uh, an event of the first of the first fruits, not first fruits, I say first of the fruits because this was uh, the way it's given in the spring feasts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but you sort of have the early barley uh, harvest and, uh, and uh, the first of these feasts, and then it goes into the greater uh, harvest with the wheat uh, leading up to Shavuot. So we are approaching uh, this time of uh, the first of the fruits resurrection. And uh, this period where um, um, we are uh, considering now uh, the resurrection of Messiah. And so this is, this is not just good news. This is the news. Okay. This is the greatest event that has ever occurred in human history. There is no greater event. We are on the eve or on the approach to the eve of this the ev of the greatest event to ever have occurred. It's not a event. It's the event. And it is the central part of our father's uh, um, plan of redemption as a part of everything that he is doing. And so we want to take very seriously this week. And, uh, and so this is, this is why. In the Torah, in Leviticus 23, 4, 7, it says this. These are the appointed times or feasts of Yah. So they're not Christians uh, to be hijacked by Christian tradition. They're not to be hijacked by Jewish tradition. These are his appointed times. They are set-apart gatherings, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. This is why you don't see me do unleavened messages at other times of the year or do another message during this week that has nothing to do or is focused on this. This is an actual instruction given to us in Torah. And so it's why we do this. For many of you, you understand a lot of this. You've been on this journey for a while, yet there are many here right now for the first time that are hearing things or considering things, which many of you considered for years now. Be respectful of those brethren and, and, and know that they have their journey and we are there to help them 
that you're there to understand them and also be respectful of that. The father's going to be continuing to do the work in us, no matter how long we've been on this journey and no matter how much we think we know. On the first month of the 14th day of the month at twilight is Yah's Passover. Okay, so here we are. We're commencing the week of unleavened. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to Yah. This is to him. For seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread. Not seven days, you'll just not eat leavened bread. For seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread, is the instruction. And this often can get missed in uh, in what's being uh, instructed. I know I I know many people for years they just would focus on not eating leavened bread, you know, focusing on what not to eat, and not actually the instruction of what to eat. And there's something that we're going to focus on here today in in relationship to that instruction. Why would he say specifically to eat leavened bread? <clears throat> it's a big. It's, it's in central instruction around this appointed time is to actually eat it. Why? Why such a big deal? On the first day, you shall have uh, a solemn assembly and, a, and you shall do no ordinary work, which we did do. Okay. So, again, for those who are just trying to understand this and how it all sort of plays out and where we're at. I've got the chart up here for you to understand. We've got the biblical weekly day count. The seventh day is what falls on the Gregorian calendar as a Saturday. Don't get all caught up in worrying about and, you know, oh my goodness, you know, we're using ancient Babylonian or pagan names or whatever it is, you know, whatnot. It is day seven. The fact that it falls on what is called Saturday on the Gregorian calendar is just the way it worked out. You don't have to be freaking out about that. What we call on the modern Gregorian calendars every day of the week is pagan in name. The calendar is pagan that we all operate to every week. The biblical calendar on a weekly basis goes day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. That's all. That's all that's happening. So when this actual, when this Gregorian calendar, when these pagan names came into being, this is where it had fallen on a biblical week. It may have been that, you know, it fell and what the, what the, um, the, the sort of Babylonian pagan sort of Gregorian calendar, they may have called Saturday, Wednesday, and then it just would have been Wednesday was the seventh day. Don't get caught up in this stuff. There's a lot of people that get confusion and they get worry and they get all this kind of thing. You've come out of this. And even though we are in it, we are not of it. I don't care that they call Saturday the Sabbath. It's irrelevant to me. It just doesn't matter what Rome wishes to call the days of the week. What matters is that what they call Saturday is the seventh day of the biblical calendar week okay and so we are to think day one day two day three day four now this month happens to have aligned with what happened almost two thousand years ago in the actual physical fulfillment of the spring moedim now there will be the final spiritual fulfillment of it all but the physical fulfillment has occurred it happens to align this year because this of when we sighted the moon and everything else. And so the biblical monthly day this year in 2023 is that the 15th day is falling on the transition. Okay. It fell on the transition of going on the Thursday. And that's what it happened almost 2000 years ago. So the equivalent of almost 2000 years ago would have been a Thursday, but nobody in the Bible was calling it Thursday. You won't find that in scripture. You won't find it even in the time of the Roman calendars. It's just the equivalency in a modern term. One day, one night, uh, each uh, three times. So three days, three nights in the grave. Day one of that, which we would call a Sunday, 
after it comes in, there is a transition into the resurrection of the first fruit that occurs on day one in the biblical calendar. So going into the twilight is the transition between day seven and day one. We are about to approach that this twilight. There is a transition period. I've got it marked there with green lines. It's not Saturday anymore, and it's not quite yet Sunday. There is a transition. The Father has designed it this way for a reason, so that we don't get caught up. We have this time of the year, I have people arguing, no, he was raised on the Sabbath. No, he was raised on the Sunday, one not. And I got news for you. He created something called Twilight. And there's a reason for that, so we don't get caught up in all of the silliness. And it's why I believe that the transition in that transition period is when Messiah was actually resurrected. And so he's literally doing it. Now, when he came out of the grave, I don't know. I suspect, and I've got it there on the chart, my personal conviction is, is that he literally exited the grave around midnight of the first day. But his actual resurrection, I believe, would have occurred during the transition period. And so he may have spent a number of hours in there before he actually came out of the tomb. What we do know is when the ladies were there to witness that empty tomb, they were still coming under the cover or just coming out of what would be considered nighttime. So that's all that is happening there. Okay. They're not going on that journey and they are not doing it in daylight. And they're certainly not doing it on the Sabbath. This is how you know that it had transitioned to the first day. Just even the biblical account only aligns with the fact that their Shabbat would have ended. And then they did the action that they did because it wasn't the Sabbath. And so when you start to just step back and see this sort of thing. So next year, we'll see where the biblically monthly day count aligns that year with uh, with the week of unleavened bread. This year, it just happens to be aligning exactly as it was recorded in the Gospels almost 2,000 years ago, as it relates to a modern Gregorian calendar. I hope that makes sense. And so you can just think about this in, the, in those terms. Every year, that monthly day count will change, you know, as what the day of the month is. In a Hebrew month, it starts with that sighting of the renewed moon, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and so on, right to the end of the month. So basically, we are seeing the transition occurring from the biblical Sabbath day seven to the biblical weekly day one is occurring on our monthly calendar this year on day 18 of the month. So I hope that helps and to make it clear uh, for everybody as to what is happening here um, so that we don't get caught up with uh, any weirdness and all the stuff that I see every year around this, uh, this kind of thing. Okay. The reminder here is we look at a message like today, and again, I mentioned these scriptures in, in uh, the Passover, the religious Masoch teaching, but it's important that we visit this. But now the righteousness of Elohim has been manifested apart from the law, not instead of the law. Okay, this is, the Torah's not gone anywhere here. And this is what we're seeing recorded uh, in, in what Paul is referring to. He's saying, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So you don't bear witness to something that has been done away with. It's bearing witness to what it was proclaiming, which was Messiah. The righteousness of Elohim through faith in Yeshua Messiah for all who believe, for there is no distinction. This is why it became the greatest event of all of the great plan of redemption in all of the human history allotted by the creator in his 7,000 years of his great plan of redemption. Because there is not the distinction. So what does this mean now? Well, many of us are waking up now. Not only, you know, may it, some of us may have realized, especially if we came from a Christian journey, well, there's not the distinction. So therefore, I don't have to worry about or who cares about all of this stuff. And yet, Yah's given all of this for us to understand. Because it teaches us who he is and what this is all about. And if we, if we do away with it as instead of being apart from it, then we get in, ourselves into a lot of trouble, which, of course, is what we've seen. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of Elohim. All means all there. Whether you're on the Christian side of the river or whether you're on the Jewish side of the, of the river, all means all. That's it. No amount of fulfilling the instructions of Torah or no amount of denying the blood of Messiah is going to change that statement. There's a message here for both sides of the river. And this week we take this very seriously now. And they are justified by his favor as a gift. This is a gift for Elohim. This is not how good you think you are in the faith as best as you understand it. You have been given a gift. Jewish or Christian, this is a gift from the creator, this event that occurred. And are justified by his favor as a gift through the redemption that is in Yeshua Messiah. It is not in our doctrines, our traditions, or how well we think we're ticking the boxes. It is in Messiah. It always was, and all of the appointed times speak of him and point to him. Whom Elohim put forward as a appropriation by his blood. So what was required as a part of Yah's great plan of redemption, the means of actually providing this gift was going to be by his own blood. He took the ultimate accountability, responsibility, accountability, and consequence for creating us and inserting us into the time domain. No other Elohim, no other God in all of human history can make such a claim, nor does This is exclusive to the faith. It sets us apart from all other worship that has ever occurred in all of human history. If you take this out, you are no better than any other pagan worshiping religious system. To be received by faith. This was to show Elohim's righteousness, not yours, not mine, okay? This is to show his righteousness, his responsibility, accountability, and consequence to his vision, his dream, his desire. Not about us. We are learning to take our faith and become less selfish with it because we have had a me, 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 me faith often for vast portions of our lives because of his divine forbearance, his divine patience in all of this. He knew that he needed to take this full responsibility, accountability, and consequence. He had passed over the former sins. So as a part of what he's doing, this is the Passover. This is what it is ultimately about. I hope that makes sense. So here's our righteousness now. We have all become like one who is unclean. So we got inserted into the religious matrix and we've all become unclean. King David went as far as saying, I've been conceived in sin. So so he took it right to the point of the insertion into the time domain. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. The word there, polluted garment in the English, in this transliteration here, is uh, polite. The Adabagid, then the Hebrew, uh, as recorded here with the great prophet Isaiah, is literally means rags of menstruation. Okay, so the English is kind of watering that down a bit. Now, this is not my picture. It's not your picture. This is our creator's picture of how he wants us to understand this. Our righteousness is the rags of menstruation. How I see every year what I see on social media and on the internet and teachings and whatnot is mind-boggling to me. If you actually understand this by the prophet Isaiah. It's staggering, our behavior. If we actually knew what we looked like to Elohim 
in our current state, it would terrify us to the point our hearts would fail us. And yet I see these proudful justifications and arguments and things going on and division in the body every year around the so-called people who know better. And are they really looking in the mirror and seeing a rag of menstruation? I'm not sure the actions I see every year by the so-called believing body actually back that up. It should. But it's not the behavior that I witness every year, sadly. Question is, is we don't want to keep witnessing this in this community, and I certainly don't want to keep witnessing it in the mirror. In Exodus 15, 14 to 16 here, it says this, the peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Look at this. Now the chiefs of Edom are dismayed, trembling, seizes the leaders of Moab. This terror is gripping people all around something here. What's going on? All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. This would include the Nephilim. What's going on? What is causing such trembling and terror that's being recorded here in the Torah? Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. Whoa. What was the arm they were witnessing? What was causing such terror? They are still as a stone. They're so terrified. They're just frozen. Solid. Do your people, O oh Yah, pass by? You mean the arm, the strong arm here, are the people of Israel? And look at this allusion to Messiah. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. That is a great messianic prophecy tucked away in the Torah here, which many miss. We were purchased this week. Purchased. To be a strong arm of Elohim. And much, much more. I'm going to suggest to you there's something interesting going on here. What did King Balak fear? The Torah numbers in 1714 uh, here, it says, Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan of Jericho. Now, these are people 40 years of leaven removed and have now been given the Torah of the house of Israel. I'm going to suggest to you what I just read to you earlier in Exodus and what you're seeing here with Balaam. He's not fearing what was delivered from bondage out of Egypt. He's there now observing what has spent 40 years of generation and getting the spiritual leaven out of their house and learning and understanding Elohim's ways. There is a big difference as to what was delivered out of bondage in this great account of the Exodus to where it ended up and Balak is trembling and the kingdoms around it. Did you think it was just purely their numbers or their skills at fighting? And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. And I tell people, keep reading. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. What defined the people of Israel? This was a people at this point that knew Elohim's ways, that had faith in Elohim and lived without fear. And they were many. And now the kingdoms are trembling. They're on the march. They're on the march. What's going on?
I'd suggest to you that the great picture being painted here is that there had been a work done in the people of Israel. And it wasn't just their ability to learn how to wield a sword. It was their very essence and state of who they were. And Balak would have to eventually resort to an apostate prophet for hire in Balaam who said, well, pretty much the only thing you can do now is send in the women. <laughs> no, no. The reason for that is because women are very powerful in their design. And if there's anything that can lead a man astray, both physically and spiritually, it is a woman. The power of a woman is unbelievable. And in the spiritual picture here, that is what's being given. Balaam knows that spiritually, this is how to deliver corruption back into this. This is how powerful a woman is. And even though modern society might be destroying what womanhood is and, and take away the value of women, the way Yav truly views women is an unleavened woman is as powerful and as beautiful as it gets. An leavened woman is as dangerous as they come. So, as a result, we looked at this in the first teaching, the messy antics in Hebrew uprooting. Incredible. I got a question for you. Can I look at, at the people that are so-called come off each river bank and they're in there and they're doing this and this is the picture i'm seeing right now i'm going to ask you this question do you really think this is what balak and the nations around him would have feared if this is what they witnessed in the camp of israel do you think kingdoms are looking at that scene do you think anybody any enemy would look at that scene and go oh i'm trembling you would be laughing and thanking your lucky stars that that's what you were looking at because that is capable of being used for nothing. Oh, Curtis, you're being harsh. Am I? Do kingdoms fear that, that picture? You worried about that if you're an enemy? You let that go long enough and they'll destroy themselves. If this has been you or if this is you, ask yourself whether you're going to be used to come into the promised land. Because the enemy is not fearing that. The enemy is creating it. The adversary is behind this picture and fueling this behavior. What you're looking at is not a picture of a repentant people. Now, the week of unleavened bread, what does this mean for us now? I'd say that the brothers and sisters in this picture need to consider the week of unleavened bread now. First Corinthians eight, one to three. Now concerning food offered to idols. Now this is interesting. What he refers to the food as the antecedent of this now is going to be, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Wait a minute. This isn't physical food. Knowledge. Spiritual food. The word there, the gnosis in the Greek signifies general intelligence, understanding deeper, more perfect, and large knowledge of religion, even more advanced, both lawful and unlawful. It relates to moral wisdom. The root implies actually intimate knowledge. Knowledge to the point of sexual intercourse. And look what he says. This knowledge puffs up. Are we all getting together so we can puff ourselves up? 
listen to various teachings at all of branch river Shabbat, whatever it is. We just get more knowledge, puff ourselves up. Is that what I'm serving for? So I can puff you up. Do I serve because I'm puffed up? What picture are we presenting as a witness to all? Think of the third of the covenant. Thou shalt not take his name in vain. It doesn't say those with puffed up knowledge are unable to take his name in vain. In fact, I would even suggest that perhaps we're more capable of it. I'd suggest that almost 2,000 years ago in Corinth, we got an interesting thing happening here by Paul. He's actually stating something. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not. Yet know as he ought to know. This is interesting. The food offered to idols is relating to an intimate knowledge and wisdom and this is in context concerning the faith that can puff up. And when you think you know something, he ends up not knowing what he ought to know. Or she. Look at this. If anyone loves Elohim, he is known by Elohim. So the reason for the unleavened spiritual knowledge is to lead us to a heart position of love. The reason for it is actually heart circumcision. It should be humbling us. It should be leading us to that place. But why do I see every year, especially at this time, what I see? I don't want to go to the mirror and see it there. So I was just all playing out as a witness. You be the honest judge of this at this time. How is this playing out as a witness in your life? My life as a community. If we're going to be a community, then we're representing a community. And that community, the head of this community, the mayor of the village is not any of us. It's Yeshua HaMashiach. And what witness are we of him? If he is truly to have brought us together, to bring us together as a family, and he is the head, then how do we represent that head? Mark 17, 13 here. <laughs> the context of the Pharisees coming to Yeshua regarding his disciples, and they were eating with unwashed hands, essentially breaking Jewish tradition at that time. And he's letting his Talmudin just pull apart the bread with, without washing their hands, as was the custom of the religious system at that time. So they're having to go. But they're not having to go at the fact they're breaking Torah as such at this point. They're having to go that they're breaking the religious systems. And the response from the head, from our king, is thus making void the word of Elohim by your tradition. In other words, you're so focused on that which has been added to Torah that you're now going to make void what is in the Torah. Do you mean that we could, with all the best of intent, do things and then start to focus on those things and those things would actually get us off the actual instructions of Torah? We already talked about one of those, which was eating unleavened bread every day, not just not eating leavened bread. By your tradition that you've handed down in many such things you do.
I mentioned here, I got many, many letters every year there and people that are waking up and I've had people writing going, I've just realized that the, the center played may not be uh, grounded in Torah. And, um, and it's not. Now, I want to say this. I'm not picking on tradition because all tradition is bad or, you know, we're horrible people for having some tradition in our life and things like that. The point that was being made here about voiding the word is that if those traditions take us off the focus of what isn't tradition, this is the point of making the word of Elohim void. And what I was convicted in many, many years ago, when I'd participated in a setter only once in my life, and the Ruach convicted me immensely after that. And I was wondering why. What's going on here? How can this tradition be something that you're not pleased with? And so I was led to things like void, making void. Well, what's wrong with having these extra things? Like, surely this can't be bad. And the issue was that it's being taken off what it's actually saying by everything that's being added to it. And of course, the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time of Yeshua were famous for adding or taking away from the Torah. And now here we are, a setter tradition and things that have come out from our Jewish brethren, um, which was really popularized and uh, made more official in the ninth century. So it's not really that old in terms of the human time domain. And there were some things that I started to look at and go, where is this in Torah? Where are these four cups of wines and this big celebration around the Pesach that would go long into the evening, which was actually against the instructions of Torah, which we were supposed to eat it in haste. And then these things, these extra things that were on there that were added there, I mean, it's all good tradition. It's getting us to think about when we were taken out of our bondage in Egypt and everything else. And now the focus was coming on the shadow picture, not the physical fulfillment of what that was pointing to. People are now actually going right back. And their whole focus is on what happened on our people delivered out of Egypt. And then all these traditions attached to it, although the egg's a pretty hard one to explain to see you know, for the record. But but this is how it actually starts to creep in. The focus wasn't on Messiah. And in fact, then something disturbing happened here. When I started to look at this broken lame, uh, lamb bone that was on there. So regardless of the good intention by our Jewish brothers and sisters to remember the Exodus and the shadow picture of the Passover, which was pointing to the actual fulfillment of Messiah, we were seeing some things here that the Ruach was taking me through. And so this is why I share with everyone every year to take this seriously. In the Torah, in 124647, 46, it says, it shall be eaten in one house. This is not an event. This is not another Sukkot. It's not another time of the year to get together and have great celebrations. This is a solemn assembly to remember what Elohim has done for us. And we are to do this in our homes. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house and you shall not break any of its bones. And so I started to see, wait a minute, there's this, I was wondering, why am I being convicted of this? And I'm looking at this, so I'm going back to the word, and I'm looking at these things, I'm going, my goodness, there's something on this seder tradition, which is actually in defiance of Torah. Not just a nice tradition, it's actually in defiance of it. I'm like, well, what's going on here? What's happening? Why is this? The way it is. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. All the congregation of Israel. All the congregation of Israel shall keep what? Not breaking its bones. And then I saw King David in the Psalms. 
great messianic prophecy. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The association of this is to those who will respect the Torah in this regard and those who are wicked will be upset with those who do. My goodness. Just this one tradition that sits on the setter. Confirmed our third witness in scripture in John 1936. And these things took place. What things? The fulfillment, the physical fulfillment of the spring appointed times. This is the context. And he's saying not one of his bones will be broken. Now we have the disciples almost 2,000 years ago confirming King David and the Torah. So when people ask, why don't you do the Jewish setter? Because I can't find the setter in Torah. I can't find the traditions as good intent and well intended as they may be. But there's even one of those traditions which I actually find disturbing because I actually believe that it has become, whether intentional or not, an affront to my Messiah. So I began to take that seriously. And I'm just sort of sharing that with you. This is how things can creep in. But it's very easy in the Hebrew uprooting and the Messiantics are all pointing guns while they're doing a setter. And they're pointing those guns often at their Christian brethren, right? Because they've got the Easter eggs and the basket and the bunnies and everything else. Look at them. Look at them. You know, I wonder what's more offensive, a chocolate bunny or a broken lamb bone on that plate? according to scripture. And yet they see no problem attacking our Christian brethren in our puffed up knowledge. This is not to condemn anybody who's had a setter or is, you know, enjoyed the tradition of it and, you know, all those kinds of things in the past and everything else. I'm saying that the way this comes in is by adding two things which make his word void. And I'm giving this at the biggest example of somebody at this time of the year that I can think of because it does make void the very messianic or the very prophecies of Messiah himself. It's serious. I wonder really whether the the chocolate Easter bunny is more offensive. The, uh, the chocolate bunny at best is a distraction. But there are some traditions which I think are downright offensive to me now. Where is the leaven in our own lives? Here's the instructions in Exodus 12, 14, and 16. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yah throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. And for anyone who eats what is leavened, now look at this. For the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Whoa. Now we know what the physical fulfillment of this was in the spring modim almost 2,000 years ago. Now I know why that's so serious. It's all pointing to Messiah. 
on the first day you shall hold holy convocation, a set-apart assembly. And on the seventh day, you will hold a seven set-apart assembly. That's why we're meeting in the upcoming seventh day. No work shall be done on those days, but everyone who needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. This is interesting. What is happening here in these instructions regarding the unleavened week? This is a very, very harsh penalty that's going on here. That person shall be cut off from Israel. And can this get us the boot in the age to come? Not considered worthy. Notice the focus that's going on here in Exodus. An appointed time to remember and honor. Okay, tick. Some of us are getting that. This will not cease until time is no more. So it didn't stop almost 2,000 years ago. It's not going to stop in the thousand-year reign. It stops when time is no more. And he decides when time is no more. Remove the leaven from the house. It says to do this on day one. Hmm. We'll just think about that for a sec. Severe consequences for not doing so are associated with this particular appointed time. We are to gather together to remember the set apart gatherings at the beginning of this and at the end of this, in particular, are high Sabbaths. And look at this prepare the food in your own home and eat. You're going to do this with what you are preparing in your home. Not going out for dinner, not entrusting this to strangers or the Romans in your own home. The leaven knowledge of our lives, the tutor of Torah, what it teaches us, even in this modern day world, even as we come to the end of this age, the ancient instructions to the house of Israel, if we will take it seriously, does teach us. And although the blood of Messiah is covering us as a gift, it doesn't mean that he does not want us to understand why this was given in the first place that would cause kingdoms to tremble. I will just make sure everything is done ahead of time. I'm the A student. I got all the leaven out of the house on the preparation day. I'm so good, I did it ahead of the instructions of Torah. I didn't do it on day one. I did it on the day before. That's how good I am. I win. Do you know the instruction is, is day one. When you reread these things, it becomes sobering. I'm guilty of it. Has anybody ever taken the living out in the preparation day? Come on. Hands up if you've ever done that. Let's be honest. You were the A student. You're, you know, making sure this is all being done. I'm going to get it right. I'm going to get it right. In fact, some of you did it this year. Some of us did it this year. Isn't that interesting? You mean our traditions that have been associated, by the way, generally the tradition has become that it's the preparation day now. And this is 11 this year that the father was reminding me, Curtis, in your own house, stop it. Stop running away and making sure you got everything in order. Because it actually what? Doesn't actually honor the instruction. Why then is that such a big deal? Why can't I be extra careful and get it all done ahead of time? Do you know that if the focus on the first day of unleavened bread is getting rid of leaven. 
Do you know what value that could have for us spiritually during the Sabbath when we're not running around distracted by everything, trying to get things done and being a Martha? Is it possible that that thing allows us the time to digest what leaven is and why we're removing it from the house? Do you know when I remove unleavened on the preparation day, I'm not even thinking about it other than ticking a box. It is Martha on steroids. Gotta get it done. Gotta get it done. Gotta get it done. I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. Alice in Wonderland. And then comes the, day, the first day of unleavened. And it's all out. And I don't have to think about it. And actually, the instruction in Torah is that we're supposed to think about it. Interesting, isn't it? I am awesome. Look at me. Can that happen to us as a part of trying to honor his ways? And I'm saying, yes, it can. It happens to me. I am showing this because I've been guilty of it. Not because I'm so holy and set apart. I am telling you I have done this because I want to make sure I've got everything done. And end up breaking door as a result. Unbelievable. Oh, but you call yourself a teacher. Or you call yourself rabbi or pastor or whatever it is that we're doing in our religious systems. And yet I wonder if I can find some hypocrisy, even in my own actions. Now, I'm sure none of you got leaven out of the house on the preparation day. I'm sure all of you managed to do it during the first day of unleaven, just as Torah commands. But some of us who are donkeys sometimes try and rush ahead and be extra good A students so that we're awesome. And that's why you pray for your, your servant leaders. Okay. The toasters of our lives. I call this up every year. So those of you who got the leaven out of your head, out of your house, and even the ones that did it extra well, who here clean the toasters? <laughs> some, I can see some people running to their toasters. Oh yeah, you got leaven in the house, all right. Trust me, you have a whole toaster full of it. I'm not doing this to condemn you. I'm saying that it's just possible there's still leaven in your house, no matter how good you thought you were. And maybe if we'd honored it on day one, we might have actually even thought about things like the toaster. I'm not condemning anybody here. Yes, I know many of you right now gathering have not emptied or cleaned your toasters and your house has leaven contained it in that form. Toast, the crumbs are made from the burning of the toast. The burning of the leavened bread. We mix it now with the unleavened during this time. And a little bit of leaven spoils the whole lump. The crumbs of our lives and the things that they sit in. Where's the toaster in our hearts? There'll be one. Go to Yah and ask him where your toaster is in the heart. If that happened to you this year, be thankful for the blood of Messiah. But if that example exists in your life, then ask him, what's this for, Father? What is it in my life that's still there that you want me to think about? Okay. Now we've got the toaster people are going, ah, I claim my toaster. I'm good. Uh -huh, I'm still the A student. All right. Well, what about the vacuums cleaners of your life? Do you get that? You got the toaster because you're such an A student. Any of you haven't emptied your vacuum cleaners and you still have leaven in your house. See, this Tudor picture, if it just becomes about physically ticking the box and not what it's possibly highlighting, 
Who here maybe didn't empty their vacuum this year? Come on, hands up if you didn't empty the vacuum. <laughs> I'm glad to see we have honest people in the community. I'm not trying to catch you out. We're trying to make a point. I had an interesting scenario happen to me this year. Brother phones me up. He goes, and he's in admission. He's in admission. He goes, ah, oh, you won't believe what I've just realized. I want to talk about the freezers of our lives. Oh, wow. I'm not sure whether there's leaven in that or not. I'll just keep it in there. I don't want to waste good food. Maybe what I'll do is try and stick the freezer outside the house and plug it in. <laughs> oh, by the way, you better have an extension cord that reaches past your gate posts. <laughs> if, you, if you really want to try it out of that one. Anybody here got a freezer of your life? I just get a... I'm not sure about that. I'm just going to keep it for another day. Scripture would call this willingly ignorant. Suits us, you know, to do this. We can all do this. But here was an interesting admission for a brother this year. Got the little adversary Hasatan face here. This is what he says to me, and he admits this. He found himself... <laughs> Going through a drive through And he orders. And completely forgot. Because he wasn't in his own home. The food that he was about to eat was not in his home. Guess what? It didn't trigger. And he'd taken a bite of something before he realized even what he'd done. I mean, it's not a high Sabbath anymore. I can buy. I can still do work because he's doing this. And then he's in a rush. He's in a hurry. Not eating in his own home. And sure enough. So what are the drive throughs of our lives? Has that ever happened to anyone here? <laughs> or you're out and about during the week of Von Lemon? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, it's happened to me too. I'll put myself on the chopping block here. I've actually had this happen to me, and I literally probably ate three, four bites before I literally sat there realizing what I'd done. Thank goodness that was a little while ago, but nonetheless, and I sat there and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And then I realized the, why the instruction was there in Torah. If I'd honored that instruction, I would have never been at the drive through of my life. And then I wonder, what does this mean regarding spiritual health? And I think of things about what we watch, what we read, what we hear, living on the internet, entertainment, social media faiths. Is it really about focusing on what's in the home? Or is it just everywhere else? And now we're not looking at that spiritual nourishment that we can get in our own homes. So where are the drive through in our hearts? The drive through of our lives. It can happen. And we go and we do and we partake of spiritual food, which is still leavened. Because our heart desires it. Why is it such serious consequences as we spoke earlier that are contained there in Torah? I suggest to you that Revelation tells us why. In 22, 14, 15, it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. That's Messiah, by the way. He is the tree of life. And that they may enter the city by the gates. This is speaking about the thousand-year reign of Messiah. Outside 
are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. By the way, there's no atheism at this time on earth. But it does give a reflection of the people who remained in this state. And even though they may be a part of the thousand year reign, they're not entering into the city gates. They're not a part of the governance of the reign of Messiah. They live their lives as dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters. And they not only did it, but they loved and practiced this falsehood. That's not a description of some fiery torture chamber, Catholic torture chamber, and the devil is torturing people forever and eternity. That is a description of the people who didn't wash their robes during the thousand year reign of Messiah. There is no atheism here. This is what they had continued to partake in. And in fact, to the point where they loved and practiced it. The revelation of our Messiah. Could that possibly 22, 14 to 15, that could link somehow to the appointed time of the week of unleavened bread? <laughs> what if the consequence, what does it say? You'll be cut off. What does that mean? Oh, that means you're, you're going to get tortured by Elohim forever. What if it actually meant what Revelation is revealing? Okay. Kind of made this point here. I think I may be labored it enough for this year. So how do we get the leaven out of our lives? What's going on? First Corinthians 5, 6, 8 says this. Our boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? If you manage to pass all the examples that I'm giving in the physical of what could represent the leaven in our hearts, if you really managed to get through all of that, well, well done you. But I doubt there's anybody gathering here right now that just survived that. Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. In other words, because... This is what is acceptable to Elohim because he took responsibility, accountability, and consequence for us being the time domain. We have the opportunity to meet like this and have this discussion, the opportunity to get the leaven out of our house. And if, it's, if the Tudor picture is showing us in the physical how we fail, then know that that is pointing to the weightier matter, which is the spiritual. There is stuff in our lives he wants out spiritually. Let us therefore celebrate the appointed time, not with the old leaven, not with the Seder plates and the Christian communions and all this sort of stuff, but it's the, the leaven that what brings malice, this intention, this desire to do evil. Remember what Revelation said, they loved and practiced these things, but with the unleavened bread. Now look at how this is brought to a heart matter, sincerity and truth. We would be so prideful and stick neck to hide the freezers, the vacuums, the drive throughs, the toasters of our hearts. Justify and keep justifying the religious traditions. Or will we get to the point of sincerity and truth? Or will we stay in malice? So, what is our focus? If it's self, and we're puffed up with the knowledge, which was, we spoke about earlier, with a form, a form of religious wokeism. It's very self-righteous. We're seeing a lot of the Roman wokeism right now. You notice how self-righteous all these people are, even quite hateful. You will think the way I think. You will do this. Puffed up. It is right. 
I am the God of my own life. And so we now see these death cults forming with the insanity rapidly engulfing the world right now. It is right to do this and you will do it because I self-righteously don't do what you shouldn't be doing. And then they point it in your face. Nothing, nothing like somebody stopping you doing something they shouldn't be or they've overcome something in their life. And instead of actually being humble and appreciating that work done in their life, all they do is run around and point it in everyone else's face. Isn't that nice? Do you want somebody who's overcome, let's say, alcoholism to be the one pointing around at somebody struggling with it? Do you, do you really think that's a helpful thing to that person? Or how about somebody who's overcome, who loves and will share in the burden with a brother? So you can do this or a sister. You can overcome this. Or do you want the selfish finger pointed at you by the one who overcame, who's so much greater than you? This week is not just about eating, not eating leavened bread physically. That tutor picture there is to teach us so that we may have the conversation that we've had today in this gathering. It's not just about eating unleavened bread every day physically. It is about having the spiritual leaven to focus on that in our lives, in his word, in his Torah, in the account of his death, his resurrection unto life, for us to consider the spiritual toasters in our lives, vacuum cleaners, freezers, and drive throughs Are we eating spiritually unleavened in our own homes this week? Or are we still hunting around the internet for every morbid doctrinal fascination we can find? Are we actually focusing on what we should be? When we no longer struggle with something or even have overcome something, if we don't deal with these matters in our heart, we can become self-righteous and actually puffed up in it. And we're all so right and you're all so wrong as we point to each side of the river and indeed even to Rome as we all point at each other and our witness continues to take his name in vain. The religious matrix. Perhaps we should look in the mirror and not at everyone else at this time of the year. To actually look in the mirror, to do this instead of hiding behind and justifying our religious traditions and related doctrines. Is it possible that this whole thing is pointing to the weightier spiritual matter? And we should actually be looking at this in our own lives. I have the joy as a teacher of having to come on here and admit what I'm not and the mistakes that I make. I guess I could hide behind some form of self-righteous, holy man thing, but I'll choose not to do that. To let you know that I'm a work in progress, I struggle too. too. But I'm overcoming, and many of you are. And let's help each other get there. The words of our king, Matthew 14, 17, from the time Yeshua began to preach, saying, repent, turn to him, turn to the father in his ways, for the kingdom from of heaven is at hand. He's not asking us to be perfect. Indeed, we would have never have seen the way he did it with the incredible fulfillment of the spring appointed times physically. If he was asking us to be perfect, but is it possible at the heart level, he's wanting us to care again and to not excuse away and throw away the Torah, even though we may fall short of it. The leaven of the heart. Finally, brothers, in Philippians 4 a, what is true? Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure or holy, set apart. Whatever is lovely, whatever is con uh, commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Focus on what is true. His word, not making it void. Focus 
on being honorable as best we can to his ways so that his righteousness is just. And what is set apart, that it may bring forth something that is a better witness. Beware of the leaven. Beware of this, because the leaven that's being pointed out here is not relating to just eating leaven, leavened bread during the week of unleavened. John the Immerser is dealing with the Pharisees and they're coming with him. They're coming to him. Reported in Matthew 3, 7, 8 says this, but when they saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his mikvah, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath that is to come? This is referring to the wrath of Elohim, the fulfillment, the physical fulfillment of the fall appointed times. Who's warned you of that? The Torah. And he says to them, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Not just your traditions. Not just your finger pointing. Because you're all so good at ticking those very Torah boxes. Do you know, brood of vipers is an interesting description. A viper spits its venom. It's not even delivering truth in a manner which is fit for repentance. Luke 12, 1. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together and they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first. The first thing he says to his disciples, there's people starting to listen. And so we're all starting to listen now. These are good words to hear. Because as this was, as people are waking up and understanding what this is all about, first he says it to his disciples, not to all the other people gathered, to the ones that he walks closely with. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is the hypocrisy. He called them a brood of vipers as they spit it out into their face. Shall we do this to each other now? As we all fall short of his glory? Why should we even care? What does this really all matter? Matthew twenty two eighteen 18 says this. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Those invited are not unbelievers. This is the religious community. They were invited. Go therefore into the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. The thousands, thousands trampling one another. You mean we're living in a time that is approaching the actual physical fulfillment of the wedding feast of the fall Moedim, and they have gone out to the highways and the byways now. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered them, all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. That's impossible unless the blood of Messiah is in play right now. That would be impossible. Do you see what's being said there? Do you know that there are going to be people at this wedding feast that didn't know? But many of us have come to know they didn't get a chance to understand it maybe the way we have. Oh, believe me, there's no way into this wedding feast but by the blood of Messiah. In fact, Yah will send the strong delusion to the religious. Therefore, Yah sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is a lie, what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do we think that's just sinful Rome? Do you know that the scripture is written by the believer, for the believer, to the believer? These words are as relevant to all of us. And it would be 
remiss of us not to take seriously what the early call the early church was contending with almost 2000 years ago during the actual physical fulfillment of this week. Isaiah 113, bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of gatherings. I cannot endure the iniquity in the solemn assembly. Stop doing it the way we have. And let's get the spiritual leaven out of our lives. And let's bring forth fruit met for repentance. Not trying to tick our traditional Christian or Jewish celebrations, but actually understand what this means. Pride and hypocrisy is on both riverbanks. We were warned by the Messiah, by our King, by our bridegroom, beware of the leaven. You're wrong, I'm right, as we scream it. Both sides have preserved the great truths in his revelation, but both need to bring forth fruit meant for repentance. One knows the what concerning the faith in their Messiah, but they do not know him. They reject him in their own eyes. The other knows the why concerning the faith of their Messiah, but they do not know him. They have defined and replaced him in their own eyes. Did adding, did not caring, did not finding the vacuum cleaners, the freezers, the drive throughs the toasters of our hearts. Has it led to possibly not knowing who our Messiah is and why he's done all of this? So what now? And the Eve and the Ev that we're approaching here in this incredible time. Something incredible is about to happen. Almost 2,000 years ago, something incredible did happen. And we are now remembering this. His appearance was like lightning. This is no longer the suffering servant. This is the conquering king that is emerging from the tomb. His clothing was as white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards tremble just like the ancient kingdoms did. Looking at the people of Israel, Levin was out of the house. They're trembling at the pureness and the holiness of what this is as he emerges from this tomb. And they became like dead men in the face of this set apartness. They're that terrified. Something so holy has emerged from here that they are terrified to the point of dead men. And the messenger said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Yeshua, who was crucified. I know why you're here. You seek him. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come and see the place where he lay. The first of the first fruits. So the count is on. Leviticus 23, and we'll speak about this next week when we gather. As commanded, 23, 15, 16, it says this, You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. That's how you know it's the weekly Sabbath, by the way. It's built into this. We'll talk about this more next week. There's a, a debate that's taken on by many Jewish interpreters of whether this is referring to a high Sabbath or a weekly Sabbath. We'll discuss this a bit more next week. Then you shall present a grain offering of the new grain to Yah. So we're to get some message that's going to happen in this week of 11, and we're going to now take this into the Feast of Weeks, and we're going to head for the great event of Shavuot. The count is on. I look forward to seeing everybody here at 11 a.m.
on April 12th, during this high Sabbath, we're going to talk about this, this seventh day of unleavened bread in this great feast. The count will start tonight after the sun goes down and we will be in the first of the first fruits. So let's start the count. By the way, this is known as the sheaf offering. It is not an appointed time in the sense of a solemn assembly itself, but it is an incredible starting point to what is an incredible and the least honored, understood, and practiced appointed time, which is the time of Shavuot. Let's finish there, and we'll come back shortly for a Q&A.